Okay. talking about multinational corporations and corporate sociability, uh, social, corporate social responsibility and addressing climate change. I'd like to begin by us looking at a very quick video on uh, climate change. Clint. Climate change has been in the news for years, but what is it and how will it affect us? To understand climate change, you first need to know about the greenhouse effect. The earth gets heat from the sun. In the atmosphere, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide trap this heat and keep it from escaping back to outer space. Trapping some heat in the atmosphere is a good thing because it keeps the planet warm enough for us to live. But there's a problem. People all over the world are adding extra carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. That's because today we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and gas to do many of our everyday activities like driving our cars, using our computers, and heating our homes. All of this extra carbon dioxide is trapping more heat in the atmosphere, making the earth warmer and causing other climate changes too. The signs of climate change are all around us. Temperatures are getting warmer, giant ice sheets are melting, and the oceans are rising. In many places, flowers are blooming earlier, snow is melting sooner, and birds aren't flying as far south for the winter. So why does this matter? Well, if the planet keeps getting warmer, we can expect more powerful storms and more flooding, droughts, and heat waves. And these changes could cause additional problems, like the spread of certain diseases, more wildfires, and food and water shortages. Climate change could put entire ecosystems, like coral reefs, in danger, and many plants and animals could become extinct. Okay, so having had a look at uh, the impact of climate change, I will be discussing in this uh, presentation the consensus on climate change. Uh, go back again on the impact of climate change and uh, looking at the states as actors in the, in the goal to address climate change and then the potential role of multinational corporations in addressing climate change and the need for soft law as a way by which multinational corporations can engage in the dialogue towards addressing climate change and then focusing on corporate social, social responsibility as a concept by which uh, multinational corporations can get involved. So there's a general consensus that there are uh, that global temperatures have risen, and there's a need. Actually, there's a warning that uh, there is a need for world societies to both mitigate and adapt to uh, climate change to effectively avoid harmful climate impacts, which are irreversible. And there is a conclusion on the part of the of the uh, IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that climate change is accelerating and it unequivocal. unequivocal and uh, the United Nations Development Program, in fact, defines uh, climate change as the declining human development issue of our generation. To a great extent, a lot of people are arguing that the survival of mankind is tied to the state of the Earth's environment. And we have seen the impact of uh, climate change in terms of the droughts that more constantly affect a lot of societies, the potential for a lot of uh, low lying nations to be submerged, including Italy and a lot of the South Pacific nations. We've seen the effect of droughts in terms of the killing of animals and its effect on agriculture. And there's a great danger, therefore, that not only does it cause great damage on uh, the Earth itself, but it has a potential impact on security as people look for other nations to live in, and the potential loss of land, property, and human lives. The approach to the problem of climate change has mainly been led by states. 
and uh, the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee, for example, uh, the, of the General Assembly, uh, looked at ways by which the, the problem of climate change could be addressed in 1990. And this led to the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is, which is a multilateral treaty, uh, entered into a number of, uh, of states in the United Nations. And the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is considered as a very important attempt of the international community to respond to evidence of global warming. And uh, the United Nations Framework Convention has almost general membership. So that's a good thing as far as the effort on the part of states to get involved. There is a problem, however, because the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change does not really provide clear legal obligations on the part of states to address or mitigate climate change. A lot of it is largely hortatory. A lot of it is, is about promises or commitments to do something about it. And therefore, there's a lot of big commitment on the stabilization or the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And it has also failed to state that climate change is in fact a responsibility of all nations and states. So there, there has been a lot of uh, criticism of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And this was essentially addressed uh, by, the, uh, by the members of the UNFCC when it led to the creation of the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 which is, again, another landmark treaty. And this time, there were legally binding quantified commitments for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions on the part of 37 industrialized countries for the first time. The problem, however, with the Kyoto Protocol is that the United States decided not to get involved with it. And so therefore, for some, because of the lack of involvement to be a part of the United States, which we know is the largest economy in the world, some have re some regard the Kyoto Protocol as between being troubled and being terminal. And China and India did not ratify the protocol, and neither did they agree to specific limits on greenhouse gas emissions. And we know the, the, the importance of China in trying to address anthropogenic or man-made greenhouse gas emissions. And the other problem with the Kyoto Protocol seems to be that it's putting an unfair burden on industrialized nations. And developing countries don't seem to have a clear responsibility in terms of addressing climate change. And in fact, they become beneficiaries of a lot of the grant money that can come from uh, the industrialized nations. So there is a need, it would seem, to examine the, the, the problem of climate change, not just by focusing on states, but other actors that are involved actually uh, with having a problem that led to the climate change. In fact, states themselves generally do not cause greenhouse gas emissions. If we, if we look at these statistics, it is actually companies and industries which are responsible for anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And multinationals are, in fact, the major emitters across their vast operations. And a, grow, a, a growing share, therefore, of total anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions can actually be traced to the manufacturing and the production for which multinational corporations are, are involved or responsible for. So there is a need, therefore, to go beyond traditional state-centric responses to climate change, mainly because climate change should be examined as a global commons problem that requires international cooperation for, from multiple actors, including multinational corporations. And uh, multinational corporations with their knowledge base, and the capital that they have and their advanced technologies can play a significant role in addressing climate change. And they're obviously quite dominant in the global economy. And the question is, how then do we try to get multinational corporations involved in this major responsibility to address climate change, which it affects us all? Not just the current generation, but the future generations after us. The problem today is that there is definitely no legal binding instrument that covers the activities of multinational corporations, so they don't have any legal liability. However, it, doesn't, it does not mean that in the absence of any multilateral treaty that mainly covers multinational corporations, it does not follow that multinational corporations will not be in a position to actually provide some involvement in addressing climate change. And there is a potential for a recourse to soft law 
a non-legally binding uh, instrument or a voluntary code by which uh, multinational corporations can commit to do something to uh, address climate change. And the UN Global Compact, for example, on the environment is a clear example of an instance where there is voluntary commitment on the part of multinational corporations to address issues about the environment. And uh, there is evidence that the involvement of multinational corporations in ways by which they address the environment, for example, can lead to better financial returns. And mainly because uh, the investors and society actually look at the behavior and attitudes of multinational corporations uh, in the way that they do things. Now, one thing by which, one way by which we can look at the possibility of multinational corporations to address and get involved in the dialogue of, of uh, climate change would be for them to therefore commit to a soft law international agreement. And we can uh, look at this from the viewpoint of corporate social responsibility, which we know is now a major byword and a major concept in which a lot of multinational corporations abide by the idea that they do have a responsibility not just to their shareholders, but to the rest of society. So it's such a question of, of the responsibility of multinational corporations to the investors or even to their employees, but there is a growing understanding on the part of multinational corporations that they do have a, a responsibility towards the rest of society. And part of it also is looking at uh, business responsibilities which encompass economic, legal, ethical, and discretionary expectations of society. So in terms of the legal responsibility, we know that it can be ineffective in the absence of hard law, and mainly because multinational corporations have not been regarded as possible uh, entities with legal personality from the viewpoint of international law. So it's quite difficult to look at it from the viewpoint of multinational corporations at some point having a clear legal responsibility. However, if we look at the idea of multinational corporations having an ethical responsibility, even a discretionary responsibility from the viewpoint of Carroll, there is, therefore, there is a potential for multinational corporations to get involved. And one, we can, we can found the involvement of multinational corporations in, uh, in terms of addressing climate change, one, by the notion that there is a serious global commerce problem, and therefore it is insufficient for multinational corporations to just say that it is not their problem. This is a problem that involves everyone. It involves consumers, it involves multinational corporations, it involves employees of multinational corporations themselves. And secondly, it is quite clear that multinational corporations are not innocent by standards. A lot of studies shown that a major proportion of greenhouse gas emissions are actually caused by the activities of multinational corporations. And so there is a direct responsibility on their part to do something about a problem that they are greatly responsible for. And the fact, thirdly, that multinational corporations actually have the capability to address climate change because of the knowledge that they possess, the capabilities that they have, the technologies that they are in position to, to use, these are factors which would strongly argue for multinational corporations to put in a stronger hand in addressing climate change. And in fact, the United Nations Con uh, Convention on Trade and uh, Development has shown that multinational corporations can in fact mitigate climate change in a number of ways. One, they can establish clean investment promotion strategies. They can also enable the dissemination of clean technology and processes. They can also use improved appliances, lighting and insulation, and alternative power sources for heating and cooling. They can also secure the contribution of international investment agreements to climate change mitigation, and they can harmonize corporate greenhouse gas emissions disclosures and set up an international low carbon, low carbon technical assistance center. So in this presentation, we would have seen the importance 
and the urgency of doing something about climate change, mainly because of its adverse effects on the world and on society. We talk of droughts, we talk of the loss of lives, we talk of the, uh, the, the warming of, of the environment, we, we talk of uh, instances of people getting sick, we talk of people losing homes because of, of constant flooding. And for these reasons, it is important that we go beyond state-centric ways of addressing climate change and get other key actors involved in the process of addressing climate change and multinational corporations who are actually responsible for a great uh, proportion of greenhouse gas emissions are in a position to do something about uh, climate change. And we can, we can uh, base the involvement of multinational corporations in addressing climate change on, on soft law on voluntary uh, binding instruments by which they adhere to certain uh, norms of conduct that make, puts it, uh, makes it obligatory on their part to do something with greenhouse gas emissions. That will be the end of uh, my talk. Yeah, um, there, are three, there are three ways by which I would address the yeah. question that you raised. Uh, the first is the assumption that the involvement of uh, multinational corporations in corporate social responsibility is a result of an attempt to avoid bad publicity. In fact, I think we can be more generous at this time to say that a lot of multinational corporations like Unilever, for example, and perhaps even Shell after the debacle in Alaska, are genuinely interested and committed to corporate social responsibility because there is a return in investments to them. And there are studies that would show that an involvement in corporate social responsibility does provide financial returns to the business. But more than that, it goes towards that argument of what is business for? And is it just about generating profits? Or is there actually a greater responsibility to, to society? And that is the liberal view of corporate social responsibility, which is well accepted today. That's the first. The second aspect is when we talk about potential supply, the suppliers of multinational corporations, I think the science, and I'm not a scientist, the science is quite clear that it is possible to actually determine the greenhouse gas emissions of every single institution or even every single company. So even you know, as, for as long as the suppliers of a multinational corporation are identified, it is possible to actually account for the greenhouse gas emissions. And that's the reason why it's possible at, the, at a macro level to determine what the greenhouse gas emissions are of every state or every country, because the science is already uh, you know, so advanced that they're able to do that. But thirdly, the third, the third answer for that would be that if we examine today, a lot of multinational corporations are in fact uh, closely examining the activities and behavior of their own suppliers. So we can look at Nike and how they respond to criticism that uh, there might be the use of child labor in China or in, or in India. Or we examine the cases of coffee makers who are aware that the use of you know, uh, child labor in, um, in some coffee plantations or the, uh, the way that they may discriminate women can, can have an adverse effect on their activities. So for these reasons, I think 
there is a there is a genuine possibility that if multinational corporations do recognize that the, the next step for which they should step up to the plate will be getting involved in addressing climate change, there is a potential that uh, greenhouse gas emissions can be better addressed in the future. Thank you, Mike. Just to follow up, Mike, I, you put the, as it were, the recognition that something needs to be done in your, ex your yes. final explanation, not on the multinationals themselves, but on, as it were, the sort of global civil society to actually monitor and make these firms aware that it is known what they're doing. So in other words, the prime mover in the explanation you've just given is not the multinationals. They don't seem to have it in their heart. It's actually society which must bear upon them. And therefore, the model that you would need to develop is one where it is innovation in the way that society is able to put pressure on multinationals. That's a good point. In addition, though, uh, I would like to say that um, the increasing attempts on the part of multinational corporations to focus on corporate social responsibility has been driven not just by society itself, but actually, for example, by in institutions such as the United Nations. So if there is an ongoing pressure on the part of the United Nations to actually make multinational corporations more involved in, um, in addressing climate change, then I think we have a lot of actors that are putting the pressure on MNCs to address climate change. But you have a very valid point there. Yes. As part of an observation, I was at the climate change talks in Durban, and what was striking to everyone there was the resources being expended by multinationals to lobby against any form of change. Um, for those due to United Nations events, you start off with an opening position, uh, which is then debated, and a, a final resolution is, uh, or a declaration is made at the end of the event. And the change between the final declaration and what began is, is quite startling, as the lobbying process removes most of the controversial stuff, and you're left with a kind of a bland uh, response which perhaps explains why there's so little movement between uh, Kyoto and uh, Copenhagen, and, and now everyone's hoping for something in Paris, but there will be the full resources of all the big companies there to stop anything that's going to interfere with their notion of growth. And I, 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 I can't argue with anything in your paper, but I, I don't see any change happening soon. You know, that's mm -hmm. the, Mine's more of an observation as well, really, but I think it kind of links to that. I, I have a knowledge exchange project at the moment with a group of companies in Manchester, and we're working with a tenant licensee to help them run their business in ways that are um, <coughs> more greener but more profitable as well. And we're drawing there on um, literature around the green, green business. This is getting away from the idea of um, greenness, if you like, of corporate social responsibility, but more of a, it's more about waste reduction. Mm -hmm. It's about that being beneficial to the business as a yeah. whole. Um, and you're talking about regulation and cost law, but I wonder if there's sort of a kind of bigger case to be made for how this can benefit them in the mm -hmm. short term as well as the long term. Yeah. But I think we, we examined corporate social responsibility. It took, it took a while for it to, to take root. And mainly because, for example, of the arguments of Milton Friedman, that the main purpose of a business is actually towards its investors and towards its equity holders. But I think uh, the, the time is beginning to shape to, and come where everyone is aware that everyone has to get involved in addressing climate change. And I think the time will come that uh, multinational corporations are aware that it's not just about dealing with the environment per se, not just about wastage or about flooding per se, but that they have, in fact, a major responsibility to address greenhouse gas emissions. But I think it, it, it all involves about, uh, it all involves society as well as the United Nations as well as state governments, knowing that uh, multinational corporations have got to be involved in this dialogue about addressing climate change. I think one of the issues um, for me is encapsulated in the citizenship debate. Maybe I remember a debate between 
Great Latin and uh, the track from um, the Netherlands, forgive me, I can't remember his name. Um, Great Latin, as you probably know, with Andy Crane and Jeremy Moon, who are quite fond of the corporate citizenship kind of label still within the CSI debate. And I thought a very pertinent point was citizens of where, precisely. Mm. Because you know the implication being that citizenship is a reciprocal arrangement. And with MNCs, of course, who is going to bring them to account? I think is, if we're not going to, in, to, to focus on the state as an actor, mm. th then who? You know, because a lot of MNCs actually derive huge benefits yeah. uh, from being effectively stateless That's true. in many ways. You know, um, so one sense is that there needs to be perhaps, you know, to put it on Alan's point, a, a, a stronger a, a counterweight, as it were, for yeah. MNCs to be citizens of. Uh, uh, so to speak. Yep, uh, I think what, what I recognize there is that we need to look at the limitation <coughs> of looking at uh, legal reports <coughs> for greenhouse gas emissions. And we look at voluntary commitments, and voluntary commitments can be found under the fact that if, if multinational corporations can be seen as being irresponsible in the way that they operate and the, in the way that they behave, there may be a potential impact at some point on their bottom line. And so that therefore they feel that a more irresponsible behavior actually leads towards better financial returns, mainly because of the better reputation that they are able to develop and the fact that a lot of more customers may decide that they would favor an involvement with multinational corporations that are responsible in their, in their business operations. So we move away from bringing them to court and focus on bringing multinational corporations to the arena of consumers who can actually decide on the basis of their wallets. As long as we live in a transparent and this world, I guess, you know, information is important. Yes. And, and that's important.